Texas takes over from the Ottawa, the Supreme Court of Texas, where monarchs can draw near and give their attention. But the court is now sitting. God save the state of Texas and his own order. Please be seated. The court welcomes to the bench our newest justice, Evan Young, appointed by Governor Greg Abbott and sworn in November 10th, 2021. We'll hear arguments in three cases this morning. First is 2366, Elephant Insurance Company against Kenyon from Bear County and the Fourth Court of Appeals District. Then 2462, Sirius Exit Radio against Hager from Travis County and the Third Court of Appeals District. And then finally, 2507, Field Turf USA versus Pleasant Grove Independent School District from Bowie County and the Sixth Court of Appeals District. The court uh, will hear argument uh, from uh, 20 minutes from each side and take a break between the arguments, uh, finishing them before uh, lunch. The arguments are being uh, webcast live this morning and will be available in the archives uh, later today. We're ready to hear argument in 2366, Elephant Insurance Company against Canada. Okay, please support Mr. Edie Holt for argument for the petitioner. The petitioner has reserved five minutes for rebuttal. May it please the court. This appeal involves a question of duty, and it arises in the context of the insurer-insured relationship. In Texas, there is no liability, uh, tort liability, unless there is a recognized duty. And here the facts are, are relatively simple. Mrs. Kenyon was involved in a one-car accident. She called her automobile liability insurance carrier, which is Elephant Insurance. And during the conversation with the first notice of loss representative in Virginia, Ms. Kenyon asked, should we take pictures? To which Ms. Moritz responded, yes, ma'am. Go ahead and take Excuse pictures. Me. I hate to interrupt, but uh, so are you arguing that because there's been a recognized duty between an insurance company and the insurer of good faith and fair dealing, that that wipes out any duty of reasonable prudence? No. Start, there, is, there is a duty of good faith and fair dealing. It but I'm not talking about that anymore. Right. I'm talking about the ordinary reasonable care duty that everybody has. Of course, you have to look at that relationship between the actor who has allegedly, you know, committed the negligent act. But having said that, I just want to make sure you're not saying that that duty went away because of this relationship between the insured and the insurer. Okay. The, the general rule is that in the absence of a recognized legal relationship between the parties given a right of control, one owes no duty to control the other person. So in this situation, these are really good facts for this situation, is because Elephant has no control over the driver that ultimately ran into Mr. Kenyon. So the general rule in this state is there's no liability. It's the same rule that would be in the restatement third. There's no liability under these facts because this legal relationship doesn't give rise to that duty. But are you saying that there could be a situation where the insurance company would have a duty to the insured, irrespective of the duty of good faith and fair dealings. Maybe not on these facts, but the, are you arguing that it, that that duty of ordinary prudence would never apply, not no matter this, what the facts are? Not, a, not, a, not unless a duty was assumed, because under these situations, the situation, the legal relationship doesn't exist to impose such a duty. So. We're a duty to protect, to protect the content, Mr. Kenyon from this oncoming car. Where a duty to protect would exist would be in a relationship like an employee-employee relationship or a parent-child relationship, contractee, contractor, limited situations. But even in those situations, this court has not extended a duty. The best example would be Graf, Graf versus Beer, social host liability. So social host liability, um, Person comes to the house, the, the, the host has responsibility to watch out for them, knows the argument, and then they drink too much, they get on the road, and they injure someone. So does the social host owe a liability to the person who was injured? And the answer is no. And those facts are 
are not even as extreme as these facts. So in these facts, the facts we have here, the first notice of loss representative is in Virginia. She's not at the accident scene. She can't see what's going on. She can't even control it. At least in the social host situation, you're face to face and you can see each other and you can make that decision. But the, the duty didn't get extended in that situation. And in fact, the only situations that it's been extended to or the employee-employer relationships, or at least on a regular basis, and that involves alcohol. And we don't have any of that situation. How would you, how would you distinguish this case from Thomas, uh, where the Court of Appeals held that there was a duty where the carrier's agents caused additional damage by removing and failing to replace a tarp covering the roof and by walking and using hammers on the roof? Right. That's, that, that particular case has come up. First, it came up in response to, is there a neg general negligence duty? And then it's also popped up over on the negligent undertaking side. So which, which box would you put it in? It didn't fit into either box. That's a negligent activity case. This is a situation where the, uh, the insurer's agent actually creates the harm. And so if you were looking at the restatement, this one would fall under that Section 7 situation. So it's a completely different situation. It also involves property damage. And this is a wrongful death action. And none of these theories have been extended that far. So let's take good faith and fair dealing. Good faith and fair dealing has only been in the con insured, insured context where there's a failure to pay a She's not arguing that that was breached. She's arguing other forms of negligence. She's not arguing that. Well, that one, they, they did. Well, Your Honor, you're correct. They did not argue that in response to the summary judgment. But the fourth court said that it does. They said it, it but, but that's where it came from. That, that's where it came from because the fourth court says something that is completely wrong. They say that although the applicable standard reference is good faith and fair dealing, the standard is ultimately one of reasonableness of ordinary and of ordinary care. And after they characterize it that way, the fourth gets breached in this situation or gave rise to a duty of reasonable prudence that was breached by elephants, affirmative act of instructing Mrs. Kenyon to take pictures. The good, du duty of good faith and fair dealing is not a negligence duty. It is good faith and fair dealing. It is a bad faith cause of action. It is created exactly for that reason, for a delay in, reason, a delay in pay, making payment where after liability becomes reasonably clear, not conducting an investigation before denying a claim. It involves in three situations, none of which happened to me. Hey, but the, the point that Justice Lambert keeps making is the, the duty of good faith and fair dealing, it appears to us at least, is not an issue here at all. The only issue is, did the insurance company have a duty to act reasonably like every human being has in almost every circumstance when giving instructions to the insurer? So I, I, I can see how you have a no breach argument or a, you know, there, that there's, there's not a failure to act reasonably here or a causation argument because it was the third party driver that caused it. But, but it turn, it's hard for me to grasp why. So I, I'm picturing a, a fender bender on railroad tracks, and the insured walks off and calls and says, hey, I just had a fender bender, and, and my car is sitting on railroad tracks, and I see a train coming. And the insurance company agent says, well, run out there and jump in the car and get it out of the way. I mean, don't they have a duty not to act unreasonably like that? Really, the issue here is, was it breached or not? Well, it's fair duty. Okay, so if we move out and say that there's no good faith and fair deal and put that to the side, then the other silo, there's two possible other silos. But the second silo is this negligent undertaking, and that's the back situation that you just described. It's a situation, uh, did they undertake to do something? Yeah, there's very clear elements to that particular duty, and two of them are here. The first element, the defendant must affirmatively undertake to perform, perform service that it knows or should know are necessary for the plaintiff's protection. Okay. Key words here, necessary for the plaintiff's protection. The defendant must know that. So what are the facts here? Mrs. Kenyon testified that she called, when she called to report the claim, she felt she was in a safe place. She thought her husband was in a safe place. If she thought her husband was not in a safe place, she would have told him not to be taking pictures. 
She was not expecting elephants. First notice of loss representative to give her safety guidance. She didn't even ask for safety guidance. There was a person from the fire department who stopped by and asked her if she needed help, and she said no. You can hear, you can see that or read that in the conversation that trans, transpires. She says that as between her and the first notice of loss representative, she was in a better position to assess what was going on. But so, don't those things have to do with her age? Don't those things have to do with her age? It has to do with whether or not the duty exists in the first place. Because if the duty wasn't assumed, and Elephant didn't assume any kind of type of post access guidance in this situation, what they did assume was they would take the claim information down, which they did, and they would also transfer the car over, call over to roadside assistance so someone could get a tow truck out there to tow her car. They didn't assume any other duty to provide any kind of safety advice or anything else during that call. It wasn't sent. So at first, and they didn't know anything during the call of something, some kind of service that they needed to render for her protection. Is it correct that they were trained uh, to not ask about safety? No, that, that is not correct. They just don't ask about it. They're not trained not to ask about it. And when you think about it, this actually makes sense. So if you're several states away, you can't assess what's going on in an accident scene. And again, that gets back to some of the discussion on whether or not you create a new duty. Things you look at, uh, right of control, superior knowledge. Superior knowledge plays in big in this situation. Four people, right? Four people in this situation. We've got the Ms. Pisano, person who runs over Mr. Kenyon, Mr. Kenyon, Mrs. Kenyon, and the first notice of loss representative of Virginia. Of all four people, the ones that had the best chance of avoiding this accident are the first three. The one with the least amount of ability to control the advice is the person who was several states away. So this is a, it's a situation where a duty doesn't exist, one shouldn't be created. Now, in, in, under these facts, it wouldn't make any difference anyway when you think about it, because she said she was in a safe place. She didn't think that she needed to do anything differently. So the duty of giving kind of a warning is really not even a warning. When you think about it, it's more of a reminder, the reminder of watch out for cars. So the warning that's been suggested to be given is don't take pictures unless it's safe to do so. So uh, I'm not going to take your call right now unless you relocate and make sure you're in a safe place and call me back. She was in a safe place. And this warning, really, or reminder, is something that everyone knows automatically. That is something that you watch out for cars. It's not something that you have to impose a duty on an insurance company to remind their insured. One step removed. Think about it. So, so the way this is supposed to work, according to the Kenyans, is you get the first notice of loss representative is supposed to say, don't take pictures unless it's safe to do so. And then Miss Kenyon is supposed to turn around and say that to her husband, and her husband is supposed to understand and heed it, and then avoid this car. The chances, even in this situation, of it actually changing the outcome are completely speculative. So you're creating, it would be creating or imposing a duty, if it was a new duty, a duty that would impose an extreme burden of creating a wrongful death cause of action with the potential of tens of millions of dollars in damages, actual and punitive damages. For what? You can't. Wouldn't even change the outcome in this particular case. If the, if the insurance company representative had uh, had said, "We need a we need a picture from the angle where you've got to go stand out in the street to take it," so get out in the street and take a picture of the car. Would, would this be a different case? No, not, no, Your Honor. It really would not be a different case. Even in that situation, you could rely upon the ins insured not to put themselves in harm's way to take that picture. And every accident scene is different. They are there. Well, so what if the insured says, well, there's a lot of cars out there, and the, the, co the company says, yeah, but we really need that picture, so you better get out there and take it. Those, those are not the facts here. Though. I know they're not, but what, what, what happens in that case? We've discussed trying to, you know, what would be a situation where there would be a liability imposed, uh, like, for an example, a negligent undertaking. Let's put it in that, that silo. And so if you had a situation where the insured calls and they say it's been in an accident, uh, and, the, and the representative says, are you hurt? And they said, yes, I'm bleeding. I'm bleeding. They said, okay, well, stay put. 
I will call the emergency medical services and uh, we'll get someone out to you. And he hangs up the phone and doesn't make the call. And so the EMS doesn't arrive. And, and based upon the reliance upon that call, they don't call 911. And their situation is worse. So it fits that situation. But the directive of taking pictures, there's is there's a social benefit to doing that. We know that the people are going to do it in a safe way. Um, I mean, that's what we have to rely upon the insurers to do. Uh, this taking pictures is very basic. It's on the Texas Department of Insurance website. Under the se- after getting policy information, the second thing they tell you to do is to take pictures of the damage in the accident location. So, I mean, assuming that what you're saying is correct, then, I mean, what, what about the fact that the person who would be told under Justice Blacklock's scenario to go and get the angle from the street to take the picture is being told that by someone who's going to be in decision-making of whether or not the claim is going to be covered. So what is the effect of that? Well, the person who's taking, the first notice of loss representative is just taking basic information to open the file. Even Mrs. Kenyon was told. No, I'm just talking about reliance on what that insurance representative is told by insured. They're not making that coverage determination right there. They're collecting information at that initial stage. And so they're not making. Wouldn't the insured feel obliged to do it because they have told her to do it? Well, the, the policy says. Uh, to provide the information as soon as practical, as soon as practical would necessarily entail it be under situations where you would take the picture where a car is not going to run you over. And so whether she feels like she has to do it at that moment, I don't think anyone would take a picture and put themselves in harm's way just to take the picture at that moment so that they can report back on the fall. There's nothing that says it has to be done at that moment. And so the information was needed to adjust the to adjust the claim. They asked for that information, and because it's an important piece of information, if you're going to uh, adjust the claim, any other questions? Thank you, Council. We'll hear from the respondent. May it please the court, Mr. Anderson will present argument for the respondent. Good morning. In preparing for this argument, uh, last night I was reading back through some case law, and I read the Giles case and Chief Justice Heck's concurring opinion there, and the opening lines really rang true to me. Just Chief Justice wrote, the result in the present case is not a hard call. The court is unanimous. The issue is how the result is determined in this and other insurance bad faith cases. And the concurrence goes on to discuss the difficulty of bad faith cases, and I don't want to say looseness of language, but I think we do have looseness of language here in the term reasonableness. And reasonableness is crossing over between negligence duties and bad faith. And one of the things that the concurrence makes very clear is a bad faith cause of action is a completely different animal. And it really involves malfeasance as opposed to the misfeasance that is common in a negligence case. And that is an important distinction. And I think the questions so far are recognizing, and and this one was never answered directly, and I think it's really important, asking whether or not Elephant Insurance's position is that because there is a bad faith cause of action, that that wipes out any duty of reasonableness. And when I use reasonableness at that moment, I'm talking about negligence. Is the mere fact that we have got a bad faith cause of action, which the court created for good reason, to address an entirely different type of harm and in an entirely different context? And, Chief Justice, I I think your comments and your concurrence are right. I think that area of case law has not been as well-defined as it could be, but I think that's also the nature of the common law. It develops according to facts, and you clean it up as you go. So I I think that that's not a criticism of courts, that the good faith and fair dealing court 
has not been defined as well as it could be. So let me ask you, so let's yes. assume we agree with you on that, just for you know, purposes of this question. What if uh, the plaintiff would have called a friend rather than the insurance company, and the friend had said, you need to go take pictures? What would be the effect of that? What would be the duty? And I think that's an interesting question because when you're trying to define a duty, and obviously the court wants to define a duty as narrowly as possible because we don't want to open up floodgates to everything. I think in considering duty in this context, I do think the relationship between an insurer and an insured comes into play and is an important factor for the simple reason that you have a cooperation clause. And the facts of this case make it really clear, but I think it goes beyond that. Here does, you have, does the cooperation clause give rise to a duty to you? Provide security or protection of the safety of physical safety of the insured? I think that goes too far. Uh, I think that that would be too much. We have never argued that Elephant Insurance is responsible for the safety of its insured in an accident scene. All we are arguing is they have a responsibility, a duty to act as a reasonably prudent company would. And in the backdrop of that is the cooperation clause comes into effect because an insured, any of us, knows when we call the insurance company and they ask us to do something, we're going to do it because we don't want to risk our coverage. I mean, a perfect example of that was the hailstorm hail last spring in San Antonio. I had significant damages to my cars and my roof. And I called State Farm and they had me go out and take pictures of my cars. Because of COVID, they wouldn't send an adjuster there. But they had me do pictures. They asked me about my roof, and they said, what is your house like? Can you safely go up on the roof? And I said, well, there are parts of it I can, but most of it's pretty steep. They said, don't do it. We'll bring an adjuster. So if Mr. Kenyon had decided to stand on the guardrail to take the photos to get the angle, would the insurance company be liable if he had fallen off of the guardrail? Or if you had decided to take pictures of your roof and fell off of the ladder? I think that goes more to a breach than duty. I think if we're trying to click, cut this clean on a duty issue, and I think the Court of Appeals, to its credit, tried to make it very clear, we are just here on duty, and that's how this case was decided. I think that there's a duty, I think whether it's breached and how much you have to do. I mean, personally, I think that it is not much of a burden, and this gets into weighing the duty discussion. It's not a big burden on an insurance company to just ask the insurer, is it safe to do so? If cases give guidance on whether this is an issue, the issue here is one of whether duty extends to these particular facts versus breach. That, that's a really interesting issue, and that goes back to Bill Powers' law review article years ago in which he was criticizing the court for taking cases away from the jury under duty theory. Um, and, and I think that is hard. I, I think that here you don't have facts that would give rise to wanting to narrow the duty. And well, I, I understand that, but are there, if, where should we look for it? For sources, either in our cases or in, at Powers article, I'll certainly go back and look at that, although I'm familiar with it, but are there other sources that you would say we should look to in drawing that on? I, I think traditionally this court has looked to the restatement, and so I think the restatement provides guidance, and I think a particular way of focusing it, because one of the things I was thinking about over the last couple of days is how are you going to say and what seemed the most effective to me, and it fits within that Thomas case, which I think is actually a really, even though it's Beaumont Court of Appeals, no petition to it, hasn't seen here for you, but I think it's a very common sense case that if in the investigation process, the representatives of the insurance company do some damage that is outside the scope of the claim, within the insurance policy, then there is separate liability for that damage, and it falls under a negligence claim. 
but what damage is occurring here? What, what negligent activity by the insurance company is occurring here? That's occurring here. I, I think that the insurance company was negligent in training these first notice of loss representatives who are answering the phone call. They are a call center in Virginia. They get trained. Every accident, every call, every time, ask for photos. Tell them to take pictures. Now, an interesting twist in this particular case is... Well, let me ask you this. Is, there, is your position that the call center employees should be trained to say, do not take pictures because they are supposed to be able to predict that an, an adjuster will be able to satisfy that function? Or are you simply claiming that they might discharge the duty that the Court of Appeals created by saying, take them only if it's safe to do so? I think so, there... I, I, I read some ambiguity in your brief. Okay. Say, I, which, which you think is the proper way to discharge the duty. I think there are two steps there to that analysis it, under the facts of this particular case. The first notice of loss um, call uh, person knew that this was a one-car accident. And so liability is not an issue. This is just a collision property damage case. And Elephant Insurance, their corporate rep, said, we don't use those photos to adjust the damage. We have our own adjuster go out and take pictures, which they did a few weeks later. So I, I think, really, to discharge the duty, I think the first question would be determine whether it's a first person claim or a third person, because these pictures of the accident scene would only have any potential relevance in a third party claim. So I think that would be the first step. I think the second would, step, would you agree that uh, we look to the facts of the case to determine whether a duty arises and not, as the Court of Appeals did, just look at the duty that's pleaded and ask whether it exists in the abstract? Yeah, I think there is a balance there, but yes, I think you have to look at the facts because I think there are facts in which you can say a duty is an abstract concept, but there are factual scenarios in which, as a matter of law, the court can say, under these particular facts, this abstract duty can never apply. And generally, does a duty exist to protect, uh, to, to warn people who may be in harm's way that they are in harm's way? I, I think a duty exists to protect both sides of that bargain. I think a duty. Well, I'm asking apart from this. Situation. Okay. Is, 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 in general, is there a duty to warn people that they may be in harm's way? I think you could hold that under the facts of this case where the corporate representative of Elephant Insurance testified that they knew that accidents seemed too dangerous. If I'm walking by this accident, do I have a duty to tell the person taking pictures that they might get hit by a car? No, I think that kind of. that that. So, so generally, there's not a duty to warn people in this situation that they right. might get hit by a car. But you, 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 your position seems to hinge on some on the relationship between the insurance company and the insured, right? Yes. I, I, well, and it's not a warning to not get hit by a car. It is a. I think the duty is breached when you take affirmative actions, tell them to go do pictures, that increases the risk of harm. I mean, I, I think that in our society, yeah, we should have... A, on, on the tell yeah. to take pictures, I can go back to the question I asked uh, the other side. I wonder whether there's, there's a difference between instructing people to take pictures, which is something that reasonable people can, can handle and assess the danger of, versus instructing them to do it in a dangerous way, which... That would be a very clean case. If they said, go out, stand in the middle of the road, make sure you get pictures because that's the angle we need to have, that, that would be an easy case. <clears throat> but I don't think this one is a hard case because they're telling them, they, they know, their corporate representative testified, they know accident scenes are dangerous. They know they're not going to use these pictures. They don't need them to adjust their plan. They don't need them to investigate their plan. They're not going to use it. Nevertheless, they have these people who are answering the call being told, no matter what, every time, every call, get pictures. So if 
if instead of calling the insurance company, Ms. Kenny had reached into her glove compartment, pulled out her insurance card, looked at the back, and it said, if you are in an accident, number one, get the other driver's inf uh, insurance information if there is one. Number two, take photos of the vehicle and scene. Number three, call, call our, our hotline. And without ever making a call, she started taking pictures and got hit. Would the duty analysis be the same, or is it important here that there was a call center involved? I think the call center makes it cleaner. Uh, I do think that having that general card out there, we do, given the facts where the insurance company says, we know accident scenes are dangerous, and just puts in a four-letter phrase of, Make sure you get pictures. Yeah, it doesn't say anything else. I, I think that that would be a closer call, and that would be a, a hard call. I, personally, I would recognize a duty there. You would say they have a duty to say, take pictures of the vehicle and see if it's safe to do so or only in a safe way. I, I think if, I, they, if the card itself says, take pictures of the vehicle and see, then they potentially have breached a duty. I think that you, yes, so I, I do. I, I think this doesn't hinge on the phone call so much. Well, you, when I say your case, yeah. I mean the duty that you are arguing for, you're not breaching causation, but the duty itself is not hinged on the fact that there's a phone call involved. I, I think that the, I would argue for a broader duty. I, I recognize that the court generally wants to narrow duties and let them expand slowly over time, and really bad facts and sad cases can sometimes cause a court to jump way out ahead if the common law doesn't develop you know, as incrementally as you prefer. Um, in this case, I think has a lot of those facts, so I think you could, I would personally, I think it would be a reasonable duty on an insurer if they're going to tell people whatever the format to take pictures at an accident scene to include, you know, three words or four words if it's safe to do so. Five words. If, if we do that, then, then what's left of the negligent undertaking analysis? But for, are you arguing that because the insurance company is instructing them to take pictures, that that's an undertaking? Should we put it yeah. in that box? Yeah, see, the box, the box to me is a hard one because I think you can get there with just – there is a duty to have it reasonable and investigate. Okay, but if that's the case, then why do we, doesn't that wipe out the relevance of the undertaking duty? Because you would never need to ask if there's an undertaking to create a duty if there's always a duty to act reasonably. I, I think that, yes, because I think if you recognize that duty, the undertaking becomes a back, is a backup, and it's subsumed within the duty as you're describing it right now. If uh, it did, it's as you're describing. Well, the court, we're describing. <laughs> if the court doesn't think that there's that duty, well, if you just said in answer to Justice Blacklock's question that there's not a duty if I'm just walking down the street and I see somebody about to have an accident to warn. So, so if we start from that, then it seems like you've got to have an undertaking or, or something in order to to change that analysis. Well, well, I, I don't think so. Necessarily, I agree on the general way out there, but as I said before, when I was answering that question, there is there is something unique where you have the insurer insured relationship, and doesn't that go to good faith and fair dealing? I, I don't think that that is the only place it goes. That's where I think the good faith and fair dealing could be to better defined, and I think this goes towards a concurring opinion in Giles that I was discussing. So you would say this is malfeasance and not just misfeasance. No. It's, it's, like it's like an intentional tort. No, I would not. Okay. No, I am not saying that. I, I think good faith is a malfeasance, or bad faith is a malfeasance. I think misfeasance, I think there is still negligence. There is still a negligence claim. There is still a duty to act reasonably when you're investigating a claim. And so I think that's separate. I think that goes towards what Justin Lehrman said at the outset, where you asked, I think it's a really important question. 
because we've recognized in Texas a duty of bad faith or a duty of good faith and fair dealing, does that mean we've wiped out common law negligence in every case involving the insured and insurer? And think about that. Uh, counsel made the argument that we, we can't just have general negligence. That's going to open up to tens of millions of dollars of claims. Let's look at it on the flip side. If we don't recognize negligence, then we're granting immunity to insurance companies because you've developed a body of law, bad faith law. We're now going to immunize them for general negligence and all other activities, including well, it's investing. That's that's developed that law. A lot of it's been codified by the legislature now. So how do we take that into account in deciding whether to expand the common law in the manner that, that you're suggesting? I'm not suggesting, I, and I really do not believe that this is an expansion of the common law. I don't think we're expanding anything. I think we are differentiating. I think this duty always existed. I don't think the development originally in the com in common law of the bad faith claims wiped out general negligence. So I don't think the codification of that wiped out general negligence. If it's true that this existed all along, is it, is it surprising that in 2021 we should essentially be requiring a Miranda warning if you can do so safely every time someone is talking to someone else, at least in the insurance context? That would be something you would expect to have emerged from the deep recesses of the common law before today. Well, I, I think obviously these cases don't come along often because the Thomas case is one of them where you have this recognition of negligence and damage done. But, but if, if we rule for you, do you not expect that we will in fact see in every single conversation, every interaction, if you can do so safely, which be appended on every form that's in the glove box, every conversation that's recorded? become something that is almost rote and routine and, and even meaningless? Uh, I don't think it'll ever be meaningless, just like any time you warn, whether it's products or otherwise, to do something safely. Uh, so I don't think it ever but Those safety warnings are a great example. Those, you pull it out of your, your prescription drugs or the box that you get from Best Buy, and it's you know, 50 or 60 pages sometimes. Do you think that all of those things, which probably every life that emerged from some case or some idea, wouldn't it be easy if we just added six little words? Does that generally advance the cause of safety to have a 50-page document, a little a statement or something? I, I've got four seconds. I'll be real quick. I think that this case where you are, you're telling them, go do pictures, that distinguishes it from general safety warnings of how to use a product or something like that. I think in the insured, insurer context where with the cooperation clause there is a certain level of requirement to do what they tell you to do. If you're going to tell them to do this, you ought to have at least say, hey, if it's safe to it. At, so, at some point, people have to be able to assume that other people know how to behave safely. And it, 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 I, the idea that if you can behave safely, is it is it is a meaningful addition to a, to an instruction like this? It, just, it seems kind of silly, frankly. I mean, it, we all assume that other people know how to behave safely, and the, the, the idea that we have a duty to protect them from obvious dangers is just. But but you're not. To wrap my head around. It's not a duty to protect from obvious things. Uh, dangers in a vacuum. You're requiring someone, you're telling them to go take pictures. So as part of telling them to go do this, you ought to give them the out of saying, go do this if it is safe. Isn't your position, though, that even that is not sufficient on these facts because you would require more? You would re have required Elfin to say, do not take any pictures because I've determined that an adjuster could do that instead of you. I think that gets toward to the breach analysis, which we haven't really, that's not part of this case. But I do, I, I think that that fact is important, and I think it plays into it. But I think that that has to go more with breach. It just shows the, the total lack of care of this insurance company. And, I, and I'm not just down on insurance companies, but 
total lack of care of sending people every time out into an accident scene to get photographs, even in situations where they're never going to use them. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Mr. Eady, you have five minutes. May it please the court. We'll start where we began. The relationship between Mrs. Kenyon and Elephant Insurance is a contractual relationship. She bought a policy of insurance, automobile liability insurance. She paid a premium for it. For paying that premium, she gets certain coverages, like everyone else. And that's the relationship, and that's their only relationship to connected to each other. Now, it's by contract, and it's a regulated relationship as well. The state regulates it. We have statutes. But there's not a separate duty outside of the contract or anywhere else that gives rise to a cause of action for wrongful death. It doesn't <laughs> exist, and it shouldn't exist in this situation. Is there a duty between a lawyer and a client that exceeds the contractual relationship between the lawyer and the client? The, there, that is a tort situation. It does not exist. That situation doesn't exist with a insurance company and it's insured. Why? Why? Yeah. It's because it's contractual. It's there and that it's governed by the terms and conditions of the policy. Well, perhaps if the contract said that we're going to do away with any negligence duties here, but the contract didn't say that. Well, the contract says we will only pay for covered claims and we'll pay to these limits. And it's specified, it's just like any other contract. It's interpreted based upon the terms and conditions. It, it's not a tort. It's not once once you start adjusting it, all of a sudden it becomes a tort. That changes it completely. Tort liability is, is completely different in this situation. So unless it was an assumed duty, it doesn't exist in this situation. You have to create a duty that doesn't exist. Well, I think the, the lawyer is a good hypothetical. What, what, if, uh, what if she called her lawyer instead? And he said, well, you really ought to take pictures. You don't know about those insurance companies. And, and then somebody said, buy a car. And is the lawyer on the hook for a wrongful death suit? That's, that's not a professional liability cause of action against the lawyer. I don't see that coming out of that. Uh, so you really do have to go through this whole separate analysis and the Phillips factors to find a new duty. Now, keep in mind, the fourth court said they weren't doing that. And the Kenyans didn't ask him to do it either. Now, as far as looking for good life, good case law to look at, to examine this situation, uh, we refer the court to a case called Crazel versus Johnson. And this is a case involving a doctor who was a, had epileptic patients, and there was no statutory obligation to notify his patients or notify the board that he had patients who were epileptic, so they could have a seizure, and if they had a grand mal seizure, they could be involved in an automobile accident, it could be very serious. So the question is, should there be a common law cause of action? We put it on the doctor, tell his epileptic patients, look, if you've had an episode in the last year, then you really shouldn't be driving. And that would protect people out on the road in case they had a seizure. And this court said, weighing, weighing all of the variables, that you do in recognizing a duty, since this, this one is so incremental that this benefit will act, this, this warning will actually work and make any difference, and the burden is so great, creating a liability on behalf of the doctors that we're not going to recognize it. So that, that's a good example of what has to be done in, in this situation. And also, there is this no duty of, of reasonable care. So in Pagadon, this court held it is not enough to simply require employers or others to exercise ordinary care in all circumstances. Texas law requires the court to be more specific, to balance the relevant factors, and determining the existence, scope, and the elements of legal duties. So you have to determine the class of people it's going to apply to, to what exactly they're supposed to do. So the defendant has to know exactly what do I have to do to comply with the duty so I'm not subject to liability. And you have to know what the class is. It's not just insurance companies. So you buy a new car, you have AAA insurance, you make those same calls that Ms. Kenyon did from her car. And this person on the other end who has roadside assistance, and they're going to have that same conversation. So this, this part of it being insure, insurance related really doesn't have anything to do with it. Well, it's just a situation in which someone is exerting some degree of power over somebody else. Uh, your 
friend on the other side answered my, my question and said, well, if, if, in that instance, they're asking you to do something, take these pictures. We assume that that's what that meant. Doesn't it give an out? That was the, the answer he gave. It gives her an out if we just add those words, if you can do it safely. If, if we cabinet to those who are exerting some degree of control in a, a moment of stress like that and add, if you can do so safely, doesn't that cause someone in that exact moment to say, okay, the person who is ordering me to do something is giving me this out so that I now have to stop and think, is it safe as opposed to just respond normally and do what's being, what I'm being told? Yeah, that's the situation you exactly we have in the appraisal versus Johnson case. That's exactly the situation. And it's just an incremental benefit to you. You'll never know whether it makes any difference. And for this situation... But it can't make things worse. And if you can't, your, your point was it could expand everywhere. It could be so far beyond this. But if we limit it in that particular kind of way, it can never make things worse to have somebody give that out. It might make things better. Isn't that what the common law development has historically been about? So recognize the new duty, look at, look at foreseeability, social utility of the conduct, burden imposed, superior knowledge of the risk, right of control, legislative enactments in the area. It's an all factors process. And here, with the benefit being so limited and the burden being so great, this is not a situation where you would recognize this type of duty. You can't even guarantee that it make a difference in this situation under these facts, because she says she's safe. Theodore's safe. She doesn't expect anyone to give her advice on what she needs to do under these circumstances. So, he, so here, this is a situation where the trial court got it right, the panel majority got it right, and hell of the insurance would ask that this court reverse the fourth court and affirm the trial court's grant of summary judgment. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Eady. The case is submitted, and the court will take a brief recess.